seven probably, but uh, later in the 1960s, you wrote a book that was in a way a scandal. Uh, it was an enormously important and really subversive book in which you, many people said you destroyed the notion of personality. Um, not, to me, not a small thing. <laughs> and, and the idea was that normally we think of personality in terms of traits. You know, to be honest or to have high self-control or to be aggressive. And you showed that this doesn't hold water because you know, we, we had already known that, but you showed us a great deal more. People are honest in some situations and not honest in others. So personality is just doesn't have the structure that everybody thought it had. Uh, this was a very big deal at the time and, and still is. I mean, except that now we've all accepted it. I mean, I think we're all Michelians, but at the time you were given a pretty hard time, I yes. think, uh, yeah. with, with that notion. And so that was, you know, a second big deal uh, that uh, Walter came up with. That was actually the first big deal. The, the marshmallows came much later. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But uh, retrospectively, you, you were ready. And retrospectively, you had already thought of delay of gratification and of, and of whether it is a trait or not a trait. I mean, you knew a great deal um, by the time you wrote your book. As I was thinking about, about your current book, I thought that there are four themes in it, I'm going to oversimplify, and that there, is the, there are two pairs of themes and, and there is some tension between them. So the, you have the best demonstrations that traits, as we think of them, do not exist. But you also have, I think, the best demonstration of a trait in the sense that self-control, as you measure it in the marshmallow test, in that single question, it doesn't predict everything because it doesn't predict all that you'll always be self-controlled in every situation. But it clearly predicts a lot of things that are not at all like marshmallow eating. So you're well beyond the... So there is that tension between uh, an emphasis and really a major discovery, I think, uh, uh, that a reconceptualization more than a discovery of what personality is that you produced in, in 68. No traits as we think of them, and here is the best demonstration of a trait. And then there is a related tension, I think, between two other major discoveries. I mean, one is in your emphasis on situation, and you have an emphasis on change, that it is actually possible to learn and to change your behavior. This is probably the theme you love best in the book. That's what it feels like. But at the same time, you have the best demonstration we have of persistence. You know, we have children age four, and it really predicts uh, how what they will be like and how obese they will be, among other things, and whether they will be using drugs or not uh, 30 years later. <coughs> Did you feel the tension, or is it only in, in readers' minds? Because I think many readers do feel that tension, and you've been exposed to that. Yeah, I, I, I personally don't feel the tension at all, but I'm aware that it's felt and that there's good reason to feel it unless there's an explanation. So let me try to explain why I don't feel tension. Good. Because uh, while, while my 68 book, okay, uh, which is still impressed by the way, um, uh, made the case that there is much less consistency across situations than has been assumed. That is that the same person who is terrified in the dentist's office may be an incredibly courageous mountain climber. That the same individual uh, who uh, um, uh, is a, is a uh, tremendous uh, entrepreneur and, and uh, um, uh, uh, very, very uh, able to deal with complex decision with almost no nervousness uh, can fall apart in social situations. 
So the, the challenge was that there is very little consistency in who we are when the context shift. What has been discovered since then in, in that is very important and that resolves the dilemma is that the, the contextualized me remains stable over time. So there is stability over, the, over long periods of time that allow us to predict, for example, that someone who has problems, let's say for an example, with White House interns and with junk food, uh, but does not have problems when dealing with heads of state, is likely to have a pattern of that kind that will have temporal stability. So there's a big difference between things that are stable over time and things that are consistent across situations. Now, uh, going back for, to the self-control question, which is really what we're about here tonight. Self-control to me, rather than being a personality trait, is a cognitive skill or a cognitive skill set. And cognitive skills were exempted, even in my 68 book, from, from, uh, from, from, from vulnerability. That is, once you have a cognitive skill, you have it. Unless you develop dementia or something happens to lose it, you've got the skill. Whether or not you use it and where you use it is another question. So to me, self-control is a very good example of a human competence. And what can change are our competencies. We can change our competencies and we can certainly change the cognitive and emotional skills that allow us to regulate our emotions, that is, where we don't have to lose our temper, uh, we may, even if we're readily disposed to do so, that there are ways we can control it. We don't have to ring the bell, that there are ways, if we're motivated and want to, that we can do things like those little kids are doing, that allows us to use our executive function to reach the two marshmallows or to reach the goals we have, and so on. So I'm not suggesting, uh, when I say that there is limited, very limited consistency across different situations, I'm not suggesting that the individual is empty of personality. There's lots of personality in there, but that it is expressed in contextualized ways, and rather than being thought of as traits that you have or don't, are influenced by things like your expectations, your goals, your values, and your competencies. But 